grandkids, uh, grandchildren up there. So, and also, Pastor and Cheryl, it's good to see you here. And Pastor, it's not too late. I'm gladly turned the pulpit over to a professional. So, <laughs> um, thank you. Perfect. Um, let me first say that uh, several inquired about my wife. She had surgery yesterday. Um, Pam has a large bunion that caused a deformity of her great toe, and she was having trouble walking with it. And so they did surgery on that yesterday and put a uh, metal plate on the toe to realign the toe. So she's going to be out for six to eight weeks with her uh, foot, so she will not be playing the organ. Uh, but she wants to extend a special thanks to Gail and Shirley for filling in during that time, in addition to their normal weeks they play the keyboard. And also, if there's anyone else that plays the keyboard, um, now that Cheryl's leaving for Arizona, we could certainly uh, use the help, she says. So uh, feel free to talk to me. Um, let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Sabbath morning that we can be together and study your word. We ask your blessing on our time together. Send your spirit to be among us. And may the words that are spoken be yours and not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to talk about the gift of the spirit for a little bit this morning. Let me just uh, up front say that I'm going to give some stories from my experience and I want the stories to be emphasis on the work of the Lord that he does through each one of us and not on me. I've been blessed in my life. I've had several experiences where I think the Holy Spirit led me. And I hope you can apply those to your own life as well. What's the most precious gift you've ever received? Maybe an anniversary gift, a birthday gift. Hope your husbands didn't forget your uh, anniversary or gift. Um, I've done that a time or two, and I won't do it again. <laughs> but I want to tell you about one of the most precious gifts that I've received. Well, I guess I can't walk from this, can I? I want to tell you about one of the most precious gifts that I've received. The emergency room is a very scary place, and that's where I spent my career for 37 years. Uh, it's noisy. It's fast-paced. It's chaos. Uh, it's something that I loved, and it's not for everyone. But for people who come in, it's a very scary place. And there was one young lady, a seven-year-old girl, who came in who was suffering some symptoms of meningitis. Now, the meninges is the covering of the brain, and so basically meningitis is an infection of the brain. The only way we can diagnose that is we have to put a needle in the low back and take spinal fluid out to look under the microscope. If you've ever had an epidural for the ladies, it's much as similar to what you had done when you had your epidural, except we're taking fluid out to look under the microscope instead of injecting an anesthetic in there. Well, as you might imagine, it's about what you expect from a seven-year-old child having a procedure done. Now, let me say, fortunately, we're a little better these days in sedating children. But back in those days, when I began my career, they were very reluctant to let us use any sedation on children in the emergency department. So it was quite a flail. We had to hold her down. There was screaming, wailing, and so on. And the poor seven-year-old child did some stuff, too. But we finally got the procedure done and took a look under the microscope. Unfortunately, it was a very mild case, and we were able to send her home that night. And within a few days, she was better. Now, let me also say, usually Pam is here to work the slides. This is the first time I've ever done it myself, so I'm going to see if I'm coordinated enough to do this or not. Well, three or four days later, I was at the HEB that used to be up at West Avenue and Blanco Road. It's not there now. But I was out doing some shopping. I had not shaved. I had not showered. I was trying to pick up things on Friday afternoon. And lo and behold, I looked down the aisle, and here was this girl. Well, the poor thing, I thought the last person she ever wants to see is me. And so I quickly sit down another aisle, went to the opposite end of the store to go check out. As I was standing in line, all of a sudden I hear a child go, look, Mommy, it's my doctor. I wanted to crawl under a hole. But the little girl come running across the uh, whole store. Everyone looked. Give me a hug. Yeah. 
the um, young lady kind of reminded me of how we deal with Jesus, and I'm sorry. <clears throat> it's the way it is with us and Jesus. I didn't put a needle, a needle in Jesus' back, but I put nails in his hands. I abused him. I said bad things, and then I tried to hide from him. And yet Jesus was still there with open arms welcoming me back. Jesus goes a step further. Of all the gifts he's promised us, one of the most precious is he says that I'm never going to leave you. In Hebrews it tells us, for it said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Matter of fact, Jesus goes one step further, and he tells us that for all the trials that we go through, I'm going to be there for you. You face a powerful foe and the devil, and we need all the help that we need to can get, and Jesus is more powerful than the devil. And that's a promise that he's given to us. Matter of fact, in addition to that, he said that not only will I be there for you, you can live in me and I will live in you. You will reflect my character. You reflect the love that I've shown to others. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. But the question is, how does that happen? How does Christ live in us? How does Christ put his life in ours, and how do we put our life in his? And I want to spend a few minutes talking about this this morning. I'm also going to give you a couple of practical applications for my own life that I hope will be useful for you, as he's promised never to leave us alone. Now, the disciples were very worried. Jesus had promised he would never leave them, and yet now, the last week of his life had come, and Jesus was saying that he was going to leave them. The disciples' emotions had been very high and low. On Sunday morning was the triumphal entry. And finally, the disciples thought, this is the kingdom that Jesus is going to set up, and they were sky high. But Monday came, and Jesus went to the temple. He cleared out the money changers. He had contentious uh, uh, interchanges with the chief priests. And the disciples were like, Jesus, these are people you're going to need when you set your kingdom up. What are you doing? Then that afternoon, they went to the Mount of Olives on Monday afternoon, and Jesus told them, I'm leaving you, and these are the signs that you need to look for. Tuesday, Jesus went into prayer and spent the day in isolation for the most part. But then now Wednesday morning come, and once again, Jesus is teaching his disciples in John 14. He starts off in John 14 by telling them that once again, I'm going to be leaving you. I'm going somewhere to prepare mansions for you. This is very disturbing to the disciples because they still thought of an earthly kingdom. The 20 plus years of what they've been taught as they were raised in the Jewish tradition could not be overcome by the three years that Jesus had taught them because they still were looking for an earthly kingdom. So they were very uh, exasperated and concerned and scared because Jesus said he was leaving them. Jesus had been there for every contingency the past three and a half years, but now he said he was leaving them. But Jesus now spoke these words of encouragement. He told them, he said, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. How do we get the Holy Spirit? Well, you remember in Acts, there was a fellow named Simon who thought he could buy the Holy Spirit. He was watching the church grow. He was watching the large following that Peter was getting. He said, you know, his YouTube channel's working. He's got a lot of followers. He's got a lot of likes. So he went saying, I'd like to buy that. How do I get more people to uh, come to my YouTube channel and get more sponsors? You know, we don't try to buy the Holy Spirit either. But we do things trying to buy God's good graces. What comes to my mind when a fellow years ago who said that, you know, whenever I pay tithe, I always give just a little bit extra just in case I made a mistake. And I thought, you know, you've really missed the point. Heaven's not like the IRS. If we do a good deed, we don't need to get a receipt in case heaven's like that. God doesn't want our sacrifices, the fatty calves, our tithes, if it doesn't come from our hearts. 
And so Jesus, while we may try to buy heaven, and many people do that, that's not what Jesus wants. He wants our hearts. So how do we get the, get the, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit? Well, Jesus went on in John 14, and I see... I did not change the uh, location of the uh, scripture. Um, my apologies. This, I gave a modified sermon the last time was in Bolivia back in the spring. So I apparently did not change the, I did change the text, but not the location. So if you want to practice your Spanish, this is John. So Jesus said that in John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. And then it goes on. The spirit of truth, who the world... Uh, I'm going to put my glasses on. I'm sorry, I am also having eye surgery, so I don't have any contacts in today. So, <laughs> the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither has seen him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be with you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Jesus said that in order to receive the Holy Spirit, he needs obedience. Now, that raises a problem if you think about it. If we want to receive a gift like the Holy Spirit, why do we have to obey him? Why do we have to do something first? If your mom gives you a birthday present but said, I'll give you the gift only if you obey me, is that really a gift? Well, it's somewhat of a paradox, especially since we need the Holy Spirit to obey Jesus in the first place. So let me explain to you how I think this works. You remember Jesus in Luke 17 uh, had 10 lepers who came to him for healing. You remember uh, Jesus talked to all of them, and Jesus told them, go get the sacrifice for the healing offering and go to the priests, and there, present that to them, you'll be healed. Now, when they left Jesus, they weren't healed. They still had the leprosy. But as they left, they went and got the sin offering. When they went to the priest, they were healed. So, it's not that we have to do what Jesus said. It was not them doing their works that got them healed. It was still Jesus that got them healed. But Jesus needed them to obey him, be a partner with him in what happened. So... The, there's one other reason we'll come to in just a minute that's also why it's so important that we have obedience. So John, 1 John 3.24 tells us, Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given to us. I think many of you can probably relate to this picture. I remember as a kid, in the old days, before everything was electronic, they would handwrite a prescription to you and give it to you. And I would look at that and just look, trying to make sense out of it, and I had no clue what they were writing. Now, there's some doctors I've worked with, I still have no clue what they were writing. <laughs> but doctors are notoriously bad. Matter of fact, when I was in school, in grade school, I still remember to this day, my uh, report card when I'd take it home would say A, 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 B, penmanship D minus. And I won't mention the citizenship grade, but as a child, this is what it looked like to me. Medicine is much more than just learning anatomy and physiology. It's also learning the language. It's also learning how to effectively communicate a patient's condition. We spend a lot of time with medical students when they rotate with us, coaching them on how to talk with consultants. Now, most are very nice, but some of them get exasperated as the medical student is droning on and on with useless information. And so we're teaching them how to effectively communicate. There's something else that the Spirit of God does for us. We read in 1 Corinthians, but the natural man seek, uh, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can they know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And then the second verse I wrote from the Clear Word Bible. Those who are spiritual are given the ability to understand and evaluate spiritual things. 
if the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit has helped us in understanding the will of God for us through Christ. You see, the things that are spiritual are not understood by the world. Concepts like evolution or creationism, sanctification, uh, justification are foreign concepts to the world because they don't receive the Holy Spirit and his enlightenment. And that's one of the big things that the Holy Spirit does for us is enlighten us. The, uh, uh, in first, and I'm Romans 1.25, I believe it is, not only that, the world has given themselves up believing a lie purposely, but it goes much deeper than that. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, we're not going to understand the things of God. But it goes, and yeah, and I mentioned all the things that are written down here. But one more thing that the Spirit does for us that's very important. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself uh, intercedes for us through uh, wordless groans. Have you ever been to a foreign country before where you don't know the language? We spent a few days in Beijing, and probably the only symbol you're going to recognize there is the McDonald's symbol. Um, fortunately, they had pictures, although they didn't have the typical stuff you have in a McDonald's. It was a lot of things uh, that were fish that I probably did not want to touch. Um, but we had a wonderful time in Beijing. We spent a few days there before we were going on to Mongolia on a mission trip with it as written. Um, and we were able to function fairly well. Um, I did have one panic attack, by the way. We, uh, uh, Pam and I went on our own through the subways and we came out of sub subway system into the middle of a shopping mall and I had a panic attack when I didn't see a door. But the, uh, there were times where we had no, uh, no one around to help us interpret. And Carolina, I'm sure you've had many times you've helped people interpret. She works an interpreter how thankful you are that there's someone there to go to bat for you and interpret the language. Well, that's one thing that the Holy Spirit does for us. He goes before God. He takes our prayers that we're praying, interprets them for God, and so that God will know exactly what we mean. But that raises a question, and I'm, I'm going to move a little quicker here because I see our time's moving. That raises an important question, though. It's a wonderful blessing to have the Spirit pray for us and interpret for God. But why does God need an interpreter? Does God have an arterial motive or different end game for us as humans? Well, let me put it to you this way. This picture was just taken this week and released. This is a picture taken from the Hubble Space Telescope. And this picture is pictures of galaxies that are billions of light years away. Now, I mentioned to you that mortal man cannot understand the things of God and they release this picture because they say we're looking for the origin of the universe we're looking where the or universe originated from the Big Bang Theory if you will but for those of us who are Christians when you see pictures like this you realize just what an immense wonderful God we serve Amen. we are not alone in the universe in uh, Hebrews, it says that God made the worlds, plural. There are many other worlds, unfallen worlds, throughout the universe. There's also two-thirds of the angels who stayed in heaven, and they're watching with great curiosity the great controversy going, here, going on here on earth. As they had listened to us pray, at times it probably appears to them that God's not answering our prayers. And so I think the Holy Spirit interprets not just for God, because God has the same plan in mind for us that the Holy Spirit and Jesus does. But I think it's for the entire universe for them to know that this is what God has in mind for each one of our lives. So the work of the Holy Spirit is very important, I think. And that's another function of the Holy Spirit. Another gift that's given to give by the Holy Spirit is when Jesus is leaving them. He said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses for me. When we receive the Holy Spirit, it's powerful. It's like receiving a car that we're not accustomed to with much more power. But it's not just that. God offers us this gift to all of us, 
you don't have to get, you can be rich, poor, old, young. Um, the, uh, the Holy Spirit has a special role in giving us this uh, gift. But not only that, when he gives us this, he goes even one step further. He says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. The Holy Spirit is going to give us spiritual growth and power. It's going to lead to things in our lives that we can't explain. I was actually a theology major in college years ago, um, but actually was accepted in medical school, and I went that route. But there was a teacher there at that time named Smuts Van Royen, who was a very dynamic teacher, and he taught the life and teachings of Jesus. And matter of fact, some of the stuff I've used today came directly from him. But while I was there, Smuts Van Royen had a dream. He uh, dreamed that he was on a beach with a high cliff behind it, and he went walking up the cliff, and he looked out, and he saw a huge tidal wave coming. Now, there was a party of uh, uh, college students there on the beach, and he went down to warn them and said, there's a huge tidal wave coming. You've got to come up. But everyone kept laughing and playing. The music kept blaring. And he ran back up just to make sure his eyes had not deceived him. And he went back down once again and said, please, please come. You've got to come now. Trouble's on the horizon. However, he woke up. He was in a cold sweat, shaking, because he was so concerned. He said his wife just held him, and he finally went back to sleep and kind of forgot about the dream until the next morning. But the next day, one of the students came up to him and said, Pastor Van Royen, I just had an impression the need to tell you something. I said, please keep telling the students the wave is coming. There's going to be strange things like that that's going to happen more and more as end time comes. We're going into perilous times. We're going to need all the wisdom and power that we can get from the Holy Spirit. Amen. With the uh, power of the Holy Spirit, though, comes responsibility. With the child, we don't give them a lot of money like this for fear of them getting into all kinds of trouble. I can see enough candy there to rot a person's teeth. The Holy Spirit only gives us the abilities that we can handle. That's also one reason in church we tend to wait until a person's more mature and seasoned to give them leadership responsibilities. That's for their own good to keep them out of trouble. Matter of fact, with that, the uh, I think what come to mind as I was thinking about this is I was thinking about televangelists. Now they kind of, a lot of them have kind of a negative uh, uh, connotation, ne negative publicity. Uh, matter of fact, I heard one person refer to them as the WWE of wrestling. But, and the young people probably know what that is. I think a number of them, however, started out with good intentions. But I think with the power that they were given and the uh, influence they were giving, they abused it. They fell prey to women's wiles. And I say that because it always seems like it's the guys who are susceptible to that, although women may be as well. So, you know, with power comes responsibility, and we need to use it responsibly. And I think that's one thing that happens. Same thing in church leadership roles. We need to be looking out for what's best for our members instead of ourselves. So let me just summarize what we've talked about so far and then give you a couple examples and our time's going by quickly. God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. To receive this gift, God asks for obedience. The Holy Spirit gives spiritual discernment. Things we're going to have understand things that we would not understand on our own, but the Holy Spirit's going to enlighten us. The Holy Spirit interprets our prayers before the uh, hosts of heaven for our good. And then finally, with spiritual discernment comes wisdom and power. And I don't remember what's next. Let me look here. <laughs> oh, the most important thing the Holy Spirit does for us is when he comes, uh, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And I'm going to move just a little bit further here. 
And when the Holy Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak for his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and will tell you things to come. In the old days, in the days when Christopher Columbus and the colonial times, when they would sail, they generally carried two compasses on the ships. They would have one down next to the helm, next to the wheel, but then they would have a second compass up in the crow's nest high up above. Now the captain would look at his compass as they're guiding over the ocean, but at times because of nails in the ship and so on, he would get funny readings. And when he did that, he would look up to the crow's nest and said, this is what I'm getting, what do you have up there? And the guy up front would say, I think you're way off captain. And he'd defer to what the uh, crow's nest was saying because he didn't have the interference of all the nails in the ship and the metal there. That's kind of the way it is for us in our lives. We read the Bible and so on, but sometimes even when we read the Bible, we get to a funny feeling or funny readings. And so we look up above and say to the Holy Spirit, please guide me in what I'm reading. Am I on the right track or not? Let me go back. We live in a very perilous times right now. Never before has it been so confusing for our young people as to where to go. Used to be we would try to shield them from television and movies, but now it's on your phone. We live in a world where everyone does what's right in their own eyes. And we've really reached this time that Isaiah talks about where it says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Every time I turn on the TV, it seems like that the world is turned upside down. Matter of fact, I'm amazed in my lifetime, over 60 plus years, how quickly things have changed. In the 1950s, in the 1950s, they used to I'm making sure, right? In the 1950s, on television, they would not show a man and woman in bed together for fear of it giving to the wrong idea of children. Now, it was probably somewhat puritanical, but it, it, the idea was right. <coughs> Excuse me, matter of fact, do you know who the first man and woman to be seen in bed together were on television? Actually, it wasn't Lucy, believe it or not. It was Fred and Wilma Flintstone. That was back in the 19, early 1960s. I can remember this is actually a primetime television show back in the 1960s on ABC. Let me tell you another story. In my younger days, <clears throat> when I lived in Michigan, I was a flight physician, a flight surgeon on a helicopter service. We flew all over western Michigan, um, uh, transporting patients from hospital to hospital, or we would land on accident scenes and so on to carry people in remote areas. We would fly out of Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is on the southwestern part of the state. Now, Lake Michigan was about 60 miles to the west, uh, and very near Andrews University, matter of fact, of where this was at, uh, where our base was at. And we would take off to go on missions to pick up people. And sometimes as we would fly, there would be snow squalls that came off of Lake Michigan. They would not show up on the radar. And as we would fly, we would be suddenly be in whiteout conditions. You couldn't see the ground. Uh, you could have no reference points when you'd look around. Now, I know it's hard to believe, but when you would get in this condition, you did not know which was up or down. Matter of fact, one time I remember, I was sure we were turning on our side, but when you'd look at the control panel, the panel would show that we were flying level. I was glad that the pilot uh, relied on the instruments. And when we'd finally ascend out of the cloud bank and come back, sure enough, my senses were way off. The instruments were right. I wanna move on to this. 
Who's our basketball fans here? Anyone? Who's this? Yeah, Kobe Bryant. I'm going to talk about what happened to Kobe for a minute because it highlights what I went through. It was a very tragic uh, situation that happened with Kobe, and I forget how long ago this was, but Kobe was on the plane with one of his daughter and seven other people, and nine people perished in this helicopter crash. Uh, he was on his way to Camarillo, back to your guys' old stomping grounds, Drew. And um, <clears throat> they were flying. No, let me go back one step. For these helicopter services to fly, uh, and for us as well, we had to fly in what's called VFR conditions, visual flight rating. So that meant that you had to have a minimum visibility of one mile in order to take off to go on a mission. If it was less than that, then it was canceled. Well, on the day that Kobe flew, uh, they were leaving South LA and going up to the Northwest uh, to Camarillo uh, to a daughter's uh, uh, basketball camp. They had marginal conditions, but they were acceptable, and they were flying, uh, going uh, uh, along, following freeways. The pilot was actually looking down, following the Santa Ana freeway and uh, the Santa Monica freeway, and then crossing and cutting across, which I found surprising, but uh, that's what he was doing. Well, the same thing happened to him. They flew, uh, as they were only 11 miles out from Camarillo, they flew into an area that was notorious with cloud banks. And so suddenly, as they were flying along, suddenly they were in a cloud bank and had no reference points. Now, one thing that happened with him that they can't explain is he continued flying forward. Usually what you want to do is you want to come to a stop until you get a reference point. But the pilot, and by the way, the pilot was uh, Erezmayan, a very experienced pilot, the most experienced pilot of this uh, service that was based down in South LA. But for whatever reason, he continued flying forward. Well, he called in and said that I'm in a cloud bank and uh, the tower replied back, you're behind a mountain, please ping your uh, location. And so the pilot was flying along he was still looking down, trying to find the freeway below him, but now he also reached down to ping that was down below the cockpit on the left side. And by the way, uh, let me just go back a step and tell you this. The, uh, uh, this is a fascinating story. Um, this was on the Smithsonian Channel, and it's a, a program called Air Disasters where I get this, and my wife hates that show, especially when I watch it the night before we fly. But but the pilot was now in this cloud bank. He reached down to ping to let him know, the tower know where he was at. Now you know what happens when you reach down in your car to reach something off the floorboard? The wheel goes this way, and that's why they tell you, keep your eye on the road. Well, secondly, he was now looking down to his left, and you look right down below your feet, and flying in helicopters is just tremendous. Um, there's not an experience like it because you sit here and look directly at your feet down at the ground below you with 360 degrees around you. Well, I guess 180, actually. You can't see behind you. But the uh, pilot was looking down, still trying to find the freeway. At this point, he still could not see. He radioed the tower and said, ask for permission to ascend to 4,000 feet. Uh, the tower said, you're cleared for that. Well, at this point, the pilot was no longer looking at his instruments. He was looking at the ground. He was going by his feeling. And as he felt himself accelerating, he thought gravity was causing him to lay back in his seat. When in reality, he was accelerating into a death spiral and did not realize it. That's why he crashed into the ground at full speed. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. When we go by feeling, we're in trouble. <clears throat> the time that hits me is it always seems to come when it's in uh, relationships where people want to go by feeling instead of by the word of God. I know have people have come up and said, you know, I know I'm married, I know she's married, but it just feels so right. I know this is what God wants. 
young people. I know he's not a Christian, but he might change. Our relationship, it just feels so right. Don't bother me with that unequally yoked together stuff from the Bible. Don't bother me with the adultery part. Matter of fact, I didn't run this by Pam, so I may be in trouble, but I'm not, I'm not an expert on dating advice, but let me give you some dating advice. <laughs> Ladies, <clears throat> when it comes to a man, don't try to change a man unless it's his diaper. <laughs> and uh, guys, you may take the girl out of the party, but you'll never take the party out of the girl. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Listen to your elders. Listen to those around you when it comes to relationships. If God shuts a door, stop banging on it. Trust whatever's behind it is not amount, uh, meant for you. There is not an impulse of our nature, not a faculty of our mind, or an inclination of the heart, but needs to be moment by moment under the control of the Spirit of God. One more story. Our time is up, and I'll, I'll go quick here. I don't see Dora here today. But this is from a mission trip a few years ago. This is Dora uh, uh, playing Superman here out over a zip line. This the zip line was, did you go on it, Chris? It's over three quarters of a mile long and drops over 2,000 feet. It was quite a place. This was in Embato, Ecuador, by the way. And here is Ron Fuller, who was with us. And Chris was also with us on this trip, and I do not see Patrick and Esther, but Selena was on this, this trip as well. I think this is 2013, if I remember right. Ambato is a city of about a million people in uh, south of the capital, Quito, Ecuador, that's near, very nearly on the equator. We held clinics there, and there was one day that we needed, we'd run out of medications, and we needed medication. The... Uh, uh, I had two doctors from Fort Hood with me, one a Christian, not a, the other not a Christian, but none of them were Seventh-day Adventists. So I took them with me to go get medications. Well, the driver was asking which pharmacy to go to, and I didn't know. I was thinking about all the people who were waiting, and I was inclined to tell him, let's go to the nearest one, but something just said, you know, there's a time to speak, there's a time to keep silent, and this is one of those times to keep silent. So I said nothing. We wound up going downtown to a larger pharmacy in downtown Embato, and we went in, we bought some medications, but while we were there, some church members come by, very excited, and when they found out we were doctors, one of the people said, please, can you come see my husband? He's had trouble with his foot, and the doctors can't seem to do anything for it. So we wandered through the downtown in Bato with a stethoscope around our neck, feeling very conspicuous once again. But we went to this tire shop, and they introduced to the, us to his, her, her husband, who was not a Christian. And we took one look with the other doctors, the student doctors that were with me, and was very immediate with what, what they needed. And sure enough, the medicine that this guy needed, we just bought. So we had prayer for him right there. We, uh, I, I don't know what happened after that, but one thing that happened with me, and this I think can be applicable to your life, I was so worried about all the people waiting and all the stuff that still needed to be done that I already passed this off for what God had done for us. And it's not until that night that the leader came to him and goes, you know, that's a true miracle of what happened today. And I thought about it and goes, yeah, I guess you're right. I hadn't really thought about it. I was so worried about the job trying to do good that I would look right over the good that God was doing for me and for us. How many times in our life have we done that? My time's up, but one last story. And this might be more applicable for you. I live up on the north side here in San Antonio. 
And I got a phone call several years back. Now, this is well before cell phones and everything else. Uh, we had little flip phones. But I got a phone call from my wife who was at work and said, where's your wallet? I goes, well, I guess it's in the drawer where I always leave it. I don't know. He goes, well, go look. And sure enough, it was not there. Well, I'd been to the corner store that morning, and it had fallen out onto the ground. A fellow had found the wallet. Not only had he not stolen anything out of it, he saw that it had USAA and called USAA, gave them their name. USAA contacted my wife Pam and said, somebody has your husband's wallet. And so said, here's his phone number, give him a ring. Well, I went and saw the fellow and met him at the corner store where I'd lost it, thanked him profusely, tried to pay him, and he said that, you know, I don't want any money, but you can do something for me. He goes, well, sure, I'd be glad to do whatever. He had seen my cat card, my military ID card in my wallet, and he goes, did you work at the military? And he goes, yes, I do. He goes, well, he goes, you know, my dad is a colonel in the army. Would you call him up and tell him I'm not such a bad guy? There are times God pushes us out of our comfort zone. And this is one of the times that I was pushed out of my comfort zone. I thought, I, I have to do this, but this is strange. So I called the colonel up. He was very stern sounding, much like you might expect from a military officer. I explained the situation to him and there was silence. And then he said, thank you and hung up. I don't know what happened after that. Did it lead to reconciliation? Or did his dad say, my son has lost it? Which I kind of thought at one point. But you know, God asks us to plant the seeds and the Holy Spirit does the work. I don't know what happened then, but there's numerous things that happen in our lives. And it's under the guidance of the Holy Spirit that God puts us as his soldiers where he wants us. I think I'm going to end right there. Our time's up. Amen. Please stand with me as we sing the last song.